beginning in verse 15 of Matthew 12. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all, and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Bow with me for a quick word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word of God and the hope that we have as the nations look to Christ for salvation. We are counted among those who have received it from his hand. Today, we pray that our Lord Jesus would be exalted, that his person and character would be clear to us, and because of that, we would worship him all the more. For those who are among us who do not know Christ, I pray they would, they would repent and believe, and I pray, Father, that you would guide me as I speak, anoint the preaching and the hearing of your word. We are completely dependent upon your Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord Jesus had a very powerful ministry, as you know, and today Matthew quotes from an Old Testament prophet, prophet Isaiah, to teach us about our Lord's ministry, to teach us about what our Lord did, about the way he went about his business, the way he went about his ministry. And because Jesus is our Lord, the Lord Jesus, he's our, he's our Lord, he's our Savior, we learn from his example. And so as we look at today's text, we see written by the prophet Isaiah the example that we're to follow. But I think most importantly, we see the one who we're supposed to worship. And today, as we review this text together, we are given reason to worship the Lord Jesus, to admire him all the more, to treasure him all the more in our hearts. We worship him for who he is, for his character, his grace, his tenderness, his mercy, his conviction, his ability. And today, we look at six characteristics of our Lord's ministry, six, no less than six characteristics of our Lord's ministry. Matthew quotes from the prophet Isaiah to tell us who Christ was, who he is, to comment on and expand upon his character and his nature. And we review in that quotation from Isaiah's, Isaiah who Christ is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain the circumstances in which we find ourselves in our text today, if you're joining us for the first time, or if you're here, you've been following along for a while, you'll appreciate the review. If you're joining us for the first time, you'll appreciate being caught up to speed, I'm sure. But I'm going to explain the circumstances of this quotation from the book of Isaiah, and then I'm going to present to you six characteristics of the ministry of our Lord Jesus. The circumstances. Circumstances. This is on the heels of the Sabbath controversy. So the Lord created controversy over his exposition of Sabbath law. Pharisees had made the Sabbath, which is a day of rest, they'd made it into a burden for the people. And our Lord understood the Scriptures clearly, whereas the Pharisees did not. And he proclaimed that the Sabbath is a rest. It's a gift to free people who can trust the Lord enough to work six days and then rest on the seventh. He understood that. 
And so he demonstrated it through word. He spoke. He exposited the scripture. And then he demonstrated it through action. He walked into a synagogue and created quite a stir when he healed a man on the Sabbath and really upset the powers that be. So the Pharisees at this point are not happy with Jesus. That's an understatement. In fact, verse 14, we left off last week. It said, the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. So of all things, he has set them off by his exposition, his understanding, his teaching, his work of miracles on the Sabbath day. He has set off the Pharisees to the point where they're now plotting secretly to kill him. So our story in the Gospel of Matthew has taken a dark turn. And from here forward in Matthew, we see this evil and nefarious plot unfold. Is men who are in power secretly conspire to crucify our Lord. Because they hate him. They hate him. They hate that he's showing them up. They hate that he's drawing away their following. They hate that he is a threat to their little kingdom. And he's come in to upset their kingdom and to proclaim the kingdom of God, which is a kingdom of freedom and liberty, whereby men are given rest in the Lord Jesus. So they've conspired to kill him. After this controversy, they've had enough. And in verse 15, it's very obvious from today's text that Jesus is aware of their plot. He's aware of their plot. Jesus, aware of this, and because he's aware of this plot, withdrew from there. He withdraws. He knows that they're about to kill him. They're trying to get their hands on him. And he pulls away from the controversy. Now, this is part of our Lord being as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. He's dropped the bomb, and now he's leaving. He's not going to keep pushing. He pushes, but when he realizes he's pushed it enough, he withdraws. Because he's going to, at least for a time, until the appropriate time, escape their capture. It's his time to die, his time to be killed, and crucified is not yet. But fascinating to me is, aware of this, he withdrew from there, and many followed him. Now, remember what this is on the heels of. This is on the heels of a Sabbath controversy in the synagogue, under the nose of the synagogue leaders who were just humiliated. They're now plotting to kill him. He withdraws, and what does he do? He takes people with him. So there were onlookers in the synagogue. Men and women were watching what happened. They saw their leaders, the Pharisees, completely humiliated. And having now humiliated their leaders, Jesus has won the confidence of a significant number of people within that synagogue. He withdraws, goes into hiding for a season to get away from these guys who are trying to kill him. But he takes people with him. He takes people with him. He takes his following. His following is now increasing. And what does he do with them? These people he takes with him. At the Pharisees' expense. At the expense of the religious leaders. He heals them. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us, first of all, that there were a lot of sick people in the synagogue who weren't being cared for. And it is very likely that despite the Pharisees' wishes, I think it's highly likely that these healings also took place on the Sabbath. Sabbath day controversy erupts, comes to a climax when Jesus heals a man in the synagogue, creates a scene. Now he's withdrawn. He's taken people out of the synagogue with him to an undisclosed location. And what does he do? He continues on healing them. He continues on caring for the lost sheep of Israel. 
He continues on bringing nourishment to them, these people who were neglected by the Pharisees. Jesus himself brings healing to them. He cares for them. He loves them. He's tender towards these weak people who are now following him. And I think there's reason to believe that this continued on on the Sabbath day. It was a scene. But he understood that he had to get out of there. And then he says to them, he's drawn them out of the synagogue, away from the religious leaders, the corrupt leaders. And then he says to them, in verse 16, and he ordered them not to make him known. He told them to be quiet. Which I think is significant. Again, wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. He's made his point. They know who he is. The plot is being unhatched. It's, it's in motion now. They're waiting for the opportunity to crucify him. He's continuing to do works that would enrage them. Likely, he's taken all these people and he's healed them on the Sabbath. This would continue to enrage them. But instead of twisting the bloody nose even more, he does it away from them. He does it in secret. And he tells these people to keep a lid on it. Be quiet. Enough is enough. We're not pushing this further than we need to. So while Jesus certainly made his point in the synagogue, in the previous text, and absolutely humiliated the Pharisees, he did not exasperate the situation in a way that was not necessary. He's wise. He knew when to back off, to take his foot off the gas. In order for the plan to proceed according to the will of the Lord. He's as wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. And Matthew makes a point of telling us he got out of there when he had to. He left. Sometimes you don't have to stay around and take it is what I'm trying to say. Sometimes you make your point. You create the commotion. The controversy erupts. But there's a time to leave. And there's a time to say enough is enough. Let these people carry on in their own misery, and take the people who really want to learn with you. And that's what Jesus did. This is exactly, exactly how God said it would be, by the way. It's exactly how God said it would be. About 700 years before this happened, about 700 years before this happened, Isaiah, or Isaiah prophesied about, prophesied about Christ. And so if you move on in verse 17, it says, This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Is Matthew reflects on the events of the Sabbath controversy. Is Matthew reflects on the plot that has been hatched to kill Jesus. Is Matthew reflects on how Jesus left the synagogue, took people with him, and healed them, and told them to be quiet in order that this thing wouldn't be exasperated more than it needs to be, is Matthew reflects on all of that. He's reflecting on it. He is understanding that 700 years before this happened, the prophet Isaiah said this is exactly how the Savior would carry himself. This is exactly what he would do. We shouldn't be surprised. He knows when to hit the gas. He knows when to get off of the gas. He knows when to retreat. He knows when to carry on his business quietly. He knows when the point's been made. And so what does Matthew do? Well, Matthew provides for us a scriptural passage from Isaiah written 700 years before this to explain, to explain why it must have been so. Isaiah is quoted by Matthew in order to list at least six characteristics of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ. Six characteristics. Six. Written before, 700 years before this happened. 
Now, there's some who might have been tempted to think, well, why didn't Jesus just take out the Pharisees right there? Why didn't he just do away with them in the moment? Do away with them and do away with the entire Roman Empire and establish his kingdom just like that. Why wouldn't he do that? Well, I don't know. I mean, one of the things is God likes to reveal his glory over time. Slowly but surely, the plan of God unfolds. And so God reveals his glory over time. And in that, we have the characteristics of Jesus Christ, six characteristics. And here's the first one. Here's the first one. Christ was chosen by God. This is simple. This is simple. Christ was chosen by God. Verse 18. Quoting from Isaiah. Quoting from Isaiah. The Lord Jesus was chosen by God. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen. God divinely appointed Christ. There was no other man equipped to do this. The entire life and work of Christ was by God's design. This provides, by the way, legitimacy and authority to Christ's ministry. The Pharisees might have had the credentials. They might have had the certificate on the wall. They might have been recognized by their peer group. But Christ had divine authority. Christ had divine authority. There is a difference... There's a difference between being a professional and doing God's will, okay? The Pharisees were the professionals. They had their credentials. Their credentials were held by some group of people, probably the Sanhedrin. But Jesus shows that their credentialing committee were completely inept and completely corrupt, and Jesus' credentials came from heaven. Came from heaven. The Lord Jesus was chosen by God. That's the first characteristic, and that is the contrast with the Pharisees. The second characteristic of the ministry of our Lord is that he was anointed by the Holy Spirit of God. God the Holy Spirit, look what it says. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him. This is a reference, by the way, in Isaiah 42, this is a reference to Psalm 2. And Matthew actually sees to it that we have Psalm 2 quoted very early on in his gospel. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So it's interesting. You have Psalm 2. Talks about God being pleased with the Messiah. Isaiah talks about God being pleased with the Messiah, quote, picking up on Psalm 2. God quotes Psalm 2 from heaven at the baptism of Jesus. And Psalm 2 here is referenced in that quotation of Isaiah from Isaiah 42 right here in Matthew chapter 12. This is a very important verse in the Bible. It tells us that Christ is the king who was to come. Psalm 2 tells us that. Psalm 2 points to the king who will arrive and set things straight, bring justice to the earth. It is that ministry that comes with a supernatural power and God's people from all ages have always been possessed by the Holy Spirit of God. God's people have always had the Spirit of God, but there's a special anointing that increases over time that certainly rested on the Lord Jesus Christ and he carried out this powerful ministry of God by the Holy Spirit, the, sec or the third person of the Trinity. So it's in these first two points that I've made, in these first two points that I've made, we see that Christ was chosen by God and Christ was anointed by the Holy Spirit. You have the, the, the Trinity right there. The Father has appointed Christ. Christ is the one who's been appointed. And the Spirit of God is resting on Christ. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God, three distinct persons within the Godhead. In each one of those three distinct persons in the one Godhead are operative in this text, fully operative, all three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Christ was anointed by the Holy Spirit. That's the second characteristic. Here's the third characteristic of the ministry of Jesus Christ that was predicted 700 years before his ministry. The third, Christ was a preacher of justice. He preached justice. He preached justice. Verse 18. The end of verse 18, as I just read, I'll put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim, proclaim justice to the Gentiles. We need to understand as we look at this, first of all, how much the Bible talks about Christ's preaching ministry. How much it talks about his preaching ministry. He proclaims, he tells, he speaks. Every time we hear about Jesus in the pages of Matthew, pretty well every time he's saying something. And this has characterized the faithful ministry of the Word of God since the beginning of time. The faithful ministers of, of God's Word are the ones who open their mouths and speak. They're not silent. They don't silence the Word of God. And what do they speak? They speak justice. They speak justice. What does Christ speak? He is a proclaimer of justice to the Gentiles. Now, the concept of justice is one that we hear a lot about these days. In fact, we're doing a talk, as you know, at Wilfrid Laurier University. The Chinese Christian Fellowship there has sponsored the talk. They've put it together. Whereby we will be speaking on the concept of social justice. Justice is something that is very important to Christians. But as we're going to note on Tuesday, the problem with the social justice movement is they have taken something that's not justice and they've called it justice. That's the problem with it. They've taken this beautiful concept of God, glorious concept, and they've perverted it and called it something, called they basically said there is, this is good when it's evil, and this is evil when it's good, is essentially what they've done. They've called justice injustice, and injustice justice, which is the way the enemy works. But what is justice? Because our Lord was a proclaimer of justice. And I'll give you a few definitions, and I'm going to comment on them. William Hendrickson noted, that which is right, justice is that which is right in harmony with the will of God. What does God want? That's justice. In fact, as you look at the Bible, it's very difficult to distinguish between the concept of justice and the concept of righteousness, holiness even. Justice and righteousness are interchangeable almost within Scripture. D.A. Carson called justice, righteousness broadly conceived as the self-revelation of God's character for the good of the nations, yet at the same time calling them to account. So when the justice of God is proclaimed, people are being called to honor the standard of God, his holy law. And where they have violated it, they're being called to repent. That's justice. You want to know what justice is? Look at the law of God. Leon Morris noted something very similar. He said that justice conveys the notion of judgment, the passing of a sentence, which leads to the meaning condemn. Condemnation comes with justice. 
But the impartial weighing of evidence means that right is done. When justice is executed on the face of the earth, what that means is that God, God settles the accounts. The balances balance. The scales balance. Someone does this crime, this is the penalty they receive, and that's the just penalty. If you want justice to be done, people will be punished for their sins. True justice is always retributive. There's always divine retribution associated with justice. Because justice is the proclamation of righteousness. Justice is the proclamation of a God, who, of, of who God is and what he demands of us and what he will do when we fail to meet those demands. That's justice. Justice is the proclamation of who God is, what God demands of us, and what he will do when we fail to meet those demands. That's justice. Justice, and this is where it all makes sense, Jesus proclaimed justice. Justice is the proper application of the law of God. What has Jesus done up until now? If you look at the Beatitudes, if you look at the Sabbath controversy, what has he done? He's properly applied the law of God to the human heart. And he's called people to account. He was a proclaimer of justice. Justice is proclaiming the righteousness of God in a way that God intended it to be proclaimed and making application to the human heart and calling people to account, which is the Lord Jesus, it's exactly what he's done. Repent. What's that mean? Change your ways. Stop sinning. Start doing righteousness. For the kingdom of God is at hand. What's that mean? Well, you better do it soon because judgment is coming. This is the proclamation of justice, and this is what we've seen our Lord do up until now. So I think Matthew, in quoting from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 42, he's not just referencing what our Lord did on the Sabbath day, the Sabbath day controversy. Immediately, he's referencing what the Lord has proclaimed consistently since he started his preaching ministry, which really began with the proclamation of the Beatitudes on the Sermon on the Mount, which we learned was a proper application of the law of God. That's justice. That's justice. And when you proclaim the justice of God, what do you realize? There's no one who can stand against it. We're all doomed. There's no way around this. And the only way we can live is if a righteous man dies in our place. If Christ dies as our substitute. The proclamation of the justice of God is the proclamation of the law and of Jesus Christ simultaneously. It's actually very difficult to separate the two in one sense, although they are distinct. Because the law leads to Christ, and Christ embodies the law. He's the fulfillment of it. So the Lord is the proclaimer of justice. He's a preacher of justice, just like Isaiah was, just like John the Baptist was, just like Noah was. All of them were. And who does he proclaim it to? This is distinct, and this is unique to the ministry of Jesus because it begins a new era in the history of the world. He will proclaim, proclaim justice, verse 18, to the Gentiles. To the Gentiles. Which simply means to all the ethnic groups of the world. You see, up until this point, the law of God, the righteousness of God, the justice of God was reserved exclusively, proclaimed exclusively to the nation of Israel. One ethnic group. But as per the Old Testament, Isaiah 42, among other places, the wisdom of God in Christ 
at the time of the Messiah would re be revealed to all ethnic groups and not reserved exclusively for one nation. What has Christ come to do? This is wonderful news. This is wonderful news. He has come to make known the perfection of God to every single person. To you and to your families. To everyone. And to unite the world under his standard of justice is displayed in his law, which points us to Christ, and is displayed in Christ, who's the fulfillment of the law. It all comes together in him. Justice. Justice. That's the third mark of the ministry of Jesus Christ. The third characteristic. Christ was a preacher of justice. If you don't like preaching on righteousness, you would have hated Jesus' preaching. You would have hated it. You would have run him out of the synagogue too. The Lord Jesus preached true righteousness, true holiness, and pointed to the salvation of God. That's the third characteristic. Here's the fourth. Christ is meek. He's meek. M-E-E-K, meek. Now, I've looked at this term before, meek. And there are many misconceptions about meekness that need to be dispelled as we consider what it is. I preached on meekness, and I explained from the Old Testament what meekness means as the word is used in context in various passages. It's not pacifism. It's not non-resistance. It's not wimpishness. It is quiet confidence in God, especially in the face of adversity. That's meekness. Meek people have the ability to trust in God in the face of adversity. When nobody else is trusting in him, and in fact, everyone's doing the opposite. That's meekness. It is a quiet confidence in God, especially amidst adversity. So look at what it says. Verse 19, he will not quarrel or, qu or cry aloud. Now, this doesn't mean he will not preach. Because we just learned that he's going to preach. He preaches righteousness. And it doesn't mean he won't be involved in controversy because he was just involved in controversy in the previous passage. It's not saying he'll be silent. It's not saying he won't be bold as he already has been. It's not saying he won't be controversial. But what it is saying is he will not be bombastically loud, not arrogant, not brash. He's not showing up to the party looking for a fight. That's not our Lord. Our Lord has not come to the party locked and loaded looking for a fight. Now, if he has to fight to, depend, to defend the innocent from those who are tyrannizing them, he will. We've seen that. He'll create the controversy. He'll create the conflict. But he's not there to do that. He's meek. He will not quarrel, nor will he cry aloud. And the, how do I know he will not quarrel and he will not cry aloud? Well, not only does Isaiah say it, but he just withdrew. If Jesus was quarrelsome, he would have stayed in that synagogue and kept stirring things up nonstop. He would have become bombastic. But he left. Hey, point made. Time to go to another place and care for these people where we're going to get ourselves out of this controversy. My job's been done. Now, I just make a little bit of application here. I'll tell you how this passages like this have worked in my own heart, I guess, if you want to know. Statements like this one about the character of the Lord, not looking for a quarrel, or not being bombastic, at least in part, prompted me to get off social media. At least in part. Now, I'm not opposed to people being on social media. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. But for me, I just found the temptation to quarrel on Twitter too strong. Too strong. And so I said, enough. I don't think our Lord would have been on there fighting regularly. So there's a time to fight, but there's a time to withdraw. 
And the Lord Jesus knew when that time was. And he walked away. I'm not fighting with these guys anymore. He withdrew. And it says, Matthew continues, quoting Isaiah, he says, Nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. Now, it doesn't mean he didn't preach. We know he preached. What this is saying is it's contrasting with Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, where it speaks of the Pharisees and the hypocrites. And it says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. What's the point? The point is that the Lord Jesus is not out there trying to create a scene. He's out there to do his business. If the scene creates, it creates. If it doesn't, it doesn't create. He's going to be faithful. He's gentle. He's kind. And he's meek. There's no need for bombastic showiness or self-aggrandization in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think there's a word for that in churches. I think so often we want to create a big splash. So many church services are designed to create a big splash. It's the simple things that God honors. It's the quiet things that God honors. Doing your master's business faithfully, quietly, out of the spotlight, in the shadows, gives the master an opportunity to put his power on display. An opportunity to put his power on display. That was what our Lord did. That's the fourth characteristic. Here's the fifth. Here's the fifth characteristic of our Lord's ministry. Christ is merciful and kind. He's merciful and kind. Verse 20. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. What's a bruised reed? I really hope this is an encouragement to some of your hearts. I really do. Reeds are plants that shoot up out of the ground, and there's many of them all over the place. They would have been used for measuring rods. They would have been used for pens. They would have been used for flutes, make flutes out of the reeds. But to be useful, the reed had to be whole and undamaged. Couldn't be bruised. And there are lots of reeds. There's lots of them. So if you find a bruised reed and you realize that reed is not useful, you throw it away and you find a reed that is useful. Because there's all kinds of them. You want to make a flute? Well, I saw oh, there's a bruised reed. Garbage, firewood. I'll find one that's not bruised. Well, what's this saying about our Lord? It's saying that he won't do away with damaged goods. If you've come to the Lord Jesus as damaged goods, he's quite happy to receive you. He's quite happy to receive you. Just a little glimmer of faith in your heart is enough. You say, well, I can't be like all those righteous people who do all those really big good things. You don't know the trouble I've been in, the bad things I've done even in the last week. If there's just a glimmer of faith in your heart, just a glimmer, just a spark, he's not done with you. He's not done with you. And then he says, to emphasize this, Isaiah says, in a smoldering wick he will not quench. This is pretty obvious, what he's talking about. You ever seen a candle that's just smoldering? The smoke's just coming off the wick? What's this telling us about our Lord? He won't go like this. If that's you. If there's just a little bit of smoke... If there's just a little spark of faith in your heart, that's enough for him. You say, oh, but the world's caving in on me. I've done so many sins. I've let so many people down. I've failed so many times. The goodness of Jesus Christ is he takes the broken, he takes the bruised, he takes the smoldering 
and he repairs them and heals them. What did he just do in the synagogue? This poor guy's hand was withered. And Jesus goes to church that day looking for the weak, the bruised, the maimed, so he could heal them and make them strong. That's what our Lord does. This is speaking of a candle that's barely alive. He will not pinch it out. J.C. Ryle commented on this. He says, there is life in a spark is truly is in a burning flame. The last degree of grace is an everlasting possession. It comes down from heaven. It is precious in our Lord's eyes. If you have a little bit of faith, just a pinch, half a pinch in your heart, that's a gift from heaven. That means God's not done with you. That means he's not going to squash you. That means he's going to, it might be difficult, but that means he's going to make sure you persevere. And he's going to build you up. Jesus wants the weak to come to him. Jesus wants the fools to come to him. The people that have wrecked their life, he wants them to come to him. And if you come to him, he's the one that fixes it. Broken, maimed, bruised, smoldering. He'll take you and he'll give you life. He didn't come with the Pharise- for the Pharisees because they thought they had it all together. They didn't need him. He came for the ones who are being abused by the Pharisees, who are being abused by the false shepherds of Israel. Jesus Christ came for damaged goods. There's just a little bit of faith in your heart. He will nurture it. That's the fifth characteristic of our Lord. Here's the sixth and final. I find so much hope in this last one. Christ's mission will end in victory. What he started, he will finish. What he started in Israel 2,000 years ago, he will finish. What he started, he will bring to completion. He will bring the entire earth. He will put the entire earth under conscious subjection to his reign and his rule. He will do it. Look at what it says. Justice will prevail. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. Justice will prevail. We already learned what justice is. Verse 21. And in his name the Gentiles will hope. In his name. Now there's a little bit of a contrast here between the quotation in Isaiah 2 and the end of the quotation as it's recorded in Matthew. So in Matthew it says, in his name the Gentiles will hope. In Isaiah it says, the coastlands wait for his law. So the coastlands and Gentiles are being used synonymously. They're used interchangeably. Coastlands would refer to the habitation of the Gentiles across the face of the earth. They're waiting for them. Coastlands and Gentiles are being used synonymously. But then Matthew says they're waiting for his name. They will hope in his name. Isaiah says they will hope in his law. They're waiting for his law. And here's why I think that's so. Well, the law and the gospel are distinct. Sometimes it's not easy to differentiate them. John Frame, the theologian, for example, says, law and gospel differ in emphasis, but they overlap and intersect. They present the whole word of God from different perspectives. Where there is law, There is gospel. Where there is gospel, there is law, if they're presented properly. 
So how is it that Matthew says the Gentiles will hope in his name? And Isaiah says the coastlands wait for his law? Well, because when people find Jesus, they love his law. And when people find the law and they understand it properly, they go to Jesus. They intersect. If you find Jesus and you realize who he is, his law becomes sweet to you. And if you find his law and you realize what that law says about you, you run to Jesus. The two go together. John Gill commented on it, and he said, And by the name of Christ is meant his gospel, which Israel calls his law. That is his doctrine, the doctrine of righteousness, life, and salvation by him, which is the ground and foundation of hope and trust in him. Where is gospel? There is law. And where is law presented properly? There is gospel. And this is a great promise. Because you see what it's promising? It's promising that in the end, this holy, righteous standard of God revealed in his law and revealed in his gospel will be victorious. And he brings, or until he brings justice to victory. Until he brings it to victory. Verse 21, and in his name, the Gentiles will hope. The nations. This ministry of Jesus Christ will continue throughout the ages. Year by year by year by year. Christ will change the heart. The heart will change the person. The person will change the world. And this will go on over and over and over again until his righteous standard surfaces and all the Gentiles, all the nations, all the peoples, hope in his name and live joyfully in obedience to his law. This is a characteristic of the ministry of Christ that continues to flow through us, his people, even as we proclaim him in all of his glory, and we sing of him because of how good he is. Who has a savior like the one that we have? Nobody. Nobody. He is worthy of all of our praise.